uh, we've now got a session um, which is around uh, technology um, and we've got nine uh, companies who are looking to uh, um, present their uh, technologies to us. So I'm going to uh, pass over um, immediately to Tolif Mars, uh, Madsen, um, who's CEO of uh, Compact Carbon Capture AS. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, we were, uh, we are a compact uh, carbon CO2 capturing solution, uh, recently purchased or acquired by Baker Hughes. Um, so I think this is, is uh, of the proof of, of what we are trying to achieve um, or what we are achieving. Uh, this is a rendering of our plant in the middle. And uh, if you look to conventional CO2 capturing technology uh, represented by TC Mongsta, the world's largest CO2 capture uh, test center, on the right hand side, you could see the difference. And actually the TC Mongsta plan has the capacity of capturing 100,000 tons CO2 per annum, uh, while the 3C technology in the middle is uh, able to capture more than 200,000 ton of CO2 on the same concentrated uh, flue gas. So it's a double of capacity with a significant reduction in size. Uh, leaning tower piece isn't catching any CO2, but it's there to represent or compare the size of a 60 meter tall tower. And as you can see on the far right, the stripping tower of the conventional technology, we have uh, Actually, if you could swap slides again, we have placed it inside a 40 feet standard IC container. So this is the plant. The flue gas is entering on the left uh, through a fan to equalize pressure drop. It's uh, uh, going in an upward direction uh, through the absorber uh, where the solvent is introduced in a cross flow rotating uh, direction and uh, entered, uh, exited on the top without CO2. The loaded solvent is taken into the stripping unit where it's um, heated up and then releases the CO2. So you can deliver the CO2 at uh, an overpressure of about four barge, which will be energy saving in the liquefaction. If you could swap slides again. Uh, we are standardizing this in modules. So instead of tailoring, uh, tailor making, uh, uh, CO2 capture plants for each point of emission, we are standardizing in strategic sizes and then we are scaling by modules. Uh, we could have as little as 10,000 tons per year, which would be suitable for uh, uh, very small uh, emissions and pro preferably utilization uh, cases for the CO2 up to uh, uh, medium points of emission uh, in a roundabouts of a million tons per year, um, which would be huge waste energy plants or large industrial sites. If you swap slides again. So our key features is of course the size uh, with a 90% reduction on the core components. We find that we could reduce the size of the plant for up to 75%. Uh, and this uh, allows us to use uh, a lot less building materials to build these plants uh, and that would have a, a direct effect on the capex. So we're aiming for a 50% capex reduction, um, which will of course be case specific. By adding this module based scalability to the equation, we find several benefits. One of them is that you do not have to, have to uh, invest in a full capacity of uh, your production right away, but you could deploy one module and then build up a price premium for emission free products. And you could um, then add on modules as the market is going in the right direction in terms of payability for CO2 free products. The lightweight and compactness of course also gives um, a very good retrofitability. As you could see here as an example on the refinery in Antwerp, there's not much room to fit CO2 capture plants anywhere in the area. So based on this uh, um, 3C technology, you could actually mount it on stop of steel structures and have it placed wherever you would like. Uh, in terms of OPEX, the process technology itself is quite equal to conventional technology, but because the 
high G forces we are using to distribute the uh, solvents, we could use a lot, utilize a lot more viscous uh, solvents, giving us the opportunity to have more efficient solvents and a lot of uh, a higher degree of freedom on which solvent to choose. So we could use the optimal solvent for each point of emission. If you swap slides again. Uh, we have uh, been doing pre-feasibility uh, study for uh, maritime CO2 capture because of the very small size and a lightweight, we find that it's feasible to put this on ships and actually um, capture CO2 from the propulsion systems on the ships. Uh, we have performed a pre-feasibility study with a potential, a very, very uh, uh, promising results. And we're working with, with several shipping providers for potential demos in 2022 and be market ready in 2023. And that timeline is approximately the same as we have on the conventional or the, 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 the main scope with the onshore and offshore CO2 capture units. Uh, today we are capturing a CO2 at our uh, pilot plant, which is a 10 ton per day uh, um, pilot. Uh, and it's located now at the uh, Equinor test facilities uh, in uh, Porsgrunn in Norway. Uh, as you can see, the size is, is very small and it's placed inside a building, even though it's a 10 ton per day capacity. So uh, uh, it, it proves our compactness and, and it's skid mounted, so it could be transported by truck. If you swap slide again, I think that would be conclusive for my uh, presentation and I would be glad to answer a few questions at the end if the time allows for it. Okay, um, I don't think we've got any um, uh, questions coming in. A question from me uh, would be, what's, uh, so, so, so um, what type of um, customer are you looking for, for for this kind of product? How, you know, is it, is it industrial sector? I mean, you've talked about maritime, but is this, is this uh, aimed at the industrial sector? Uh, it's uh, industrial, waste energy, uh, power plants. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's a matter of where we find it uh, competitive and if we look to uh, 5 million tons or 10 million tons uh, coal fire power plants uh, I think the capex issue would be uh, um, uh, would be less significant in the overall cost perspective uh, but everything in between 10 and six seven or a thousand tons uh, per year in in emission I think we find uh, the sweet spot so and, and the, the competitiveness of our technology would increase as the need for footprint uh, is, is higher. So if you have a, 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 a lack of, of space to put your plant, I think we will have a, a large favor. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Tolif. Um, very interesting technology. Um, and thanks for your time today. Okay, I'm now gonna move on to Ian France um, of uh, uh, power star who's going to discuss behind the meter battery storage um over to you ian hello thank you scott and thank you everyone for <clears throat> for joining and to emex for uh, setting all of this up thank you well that's just me uh, so yes ian france from power star um so um what i want to talk about is the business case for behind the meter battery storage and i believe this is an area that uh, a number of companies have struggled with over recent years and we've delivered about 31 systems and well over 30 megawatt hours of these solutions. So we've, we've found a systematic way to establish um, strong business cases. What you can see on the screen is uh, a slide that represents a schematic. And I would direct your eyes, first of all, to, um, <clears throat> to the load. So right at the bottom, there's the site load. And that is um, obviously going to differ according to the different types of uh, organizations, hospitals, manufacturing, etc., and also to the EV charging load over on the right-hand side. And that's a load that today can be quite small, uh, or it could be very important and very strategic, for example, with an organization that's um, providing courier services with last mile uh, delivery via electric uh, vehicles. And in either case, in either the short or long term, the EV charging load can provide a challenge to grid capacity and to the ability to maximize the use of uh, renewable energy. 
So <clears throat> then I would direct your eyes to the three grey boxes and they represent the supply. So on the top left, we've got the incoming supply. That's from the national grid. On the bottom left, we have the controllable local generation, for example, gas-fired CHP. And then just above that to the right, we have the renewable generation, uh, solar and wind, and uh, as examples, and they are not controllable, although to an extent they may be uh, predictable, at least in the very short term. So in terms of the solution, I would then direct your eyes to the red boxes. <clears throat> On the bottom right hand side, we have the battery energy storage system. The battery can contribute to the business case in a number of ways. The first is that it can store renewable energy that's not used instantaneously, uh, therefore avoiding export. The second is it can enable you to run, for example, your CHP for longer. Uh, you might be able to keep generating and store excess electricity in the battery to use at a different time of day, uh, so, long as the, so long as you can use the heat. <clears throat> Um, the system can be programmed to buy electricity during cheap periods and avoiding expensive ones. And some of our clients are now moving to agile pricing where at four o'clock today, they will know the price of every kilowatt hour that they buy the following day in every half hour period. And in some of those half hour periods, they'll actually be paid to take electricity. So that can be valuable information to enable you to maximize the use of those types of contract. The battery can be utilized to, you, to provide UPS, that's uninterruptible power supply, and that protects the site from the impacts of blackouts and brownouts. And finally, the, the, the way that everyone has always used behind the meter battery storage is to derive revenues from the national grid contracts, such as balancing markets and FFR. Now, another critical area of the infrastructure is on the left-hand side in the red box, which is the energy optimization system. What that can do is predict the renewable generation in the immediate future to about a 97% accuracy in our case. And also it can predict loads such as the EV charging load, the site load based on the time of day, the weather conditions, etc. It can ensure then that there, it can also ensure that there's sufficient energy always stored to meet any possible UPS requirements in case of blackout. And it can make real-time decisions to charge or discharge the battery based on rational algorithms and the predictive capability that I've mentioned. It can communicate with site control systems, say to implement load shedding, pre-cooling, pre-heating, to avoid taking power at times when the grid is under pressure and uh, at times when the power can be more expensive. And we would contend that with the increased electrification of commercial scale power, that any robust net zero strategy needs to include an intelligent and inverted commas storage system of this nature. <clears throat> and finally, don't forget the green box. Um, we're great fans of voltage optimization and low, uh, low loss amorphous core transformers, which can typically save about six to seven percent of electricity going through every transformer, three to four year payback on a 50 year asset. So they're always part of our solutions where, where applicable. Thank you. So <clears throat> here we see how that starts to roll into a financial case. On the left hand side, we have a graph showing the 15 year revenue predictions from such an investment. This is a real case of a 24 seven manufacturing company. The yellow represents a solar array um, and, uh, and the uh, green represents the guaranteed savings from the voltage optimization. In between that, you've got the light and dark blue, and they represent the grid revenues, the FFR and the balancing markets and so on. And at the top, in the cherry red, you have the uh, savings that the client has deemed applicable to the UPS. And on the right hand side, if you look at the revenue proportions over the 15 years, you can see that three quarters of the revenues are pretty much bolted down. You've got the solar PV which is uh, going to carry on as long as the sun shines. The UPS is a deep saving by the client and the voltage optimization in the green is guaranteed. So there's only the quarter, which is uh, really quite variable. And of course that could go up as well as down. So how does all this wrap up into a 15 year cumulative cash flow model? Well, the solar PV alone is shown by the black line, about a million pounds of investment crosses the line in eight or nine years, nice and positive after 15 years, and that's gonna carry on for many years henceforth. Um, the second line is the amber line, so that increases the capital investment to about one and a half million. 
that allows day night shifting so energy that's, that's generated during the day can be used in the plant at night uh, and derive grid revenues that's more positive and more positive again is the green line where we extend the battery a little bit more to about a total investment of 1.7 million pounds but it gives a far better return because it provides resilience for the site and it avoids um, it avoids the impacts of grid blackouts i think i just did that in 20 seconds under my seven minutes how's that scott there you go fantastic there is a question for you um on uh, um how small can the systems be can i ask you to answer that in the q a um so that people can see the answer and Torleaf, you've got three questions um on the q a yourself um if you could answer those as uh, as well um so thank you very much uh, for that ian um, we're now going to move to Alexander Pavlov um, uh, of Atlas Copco Compressors to talk about compressed air heat recovery. Um, over to you, Alexander. Good uh, afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much. So if you can please bring up my slides. Yeah, so Atlas Copco is a global manufacturer uh, for compressor systems, vacuum, uh, industrial tools, uh, construction tools as well. So if you please go uh, and uh, maybe jump over. Yeah, so that's who we are. What I really want to speak about today is, of course, importance of the energy aspect uh, when we speak about compressed air. So actually, it's... Uh, normally about 12 percent of the of the total industrial consumption for electricity so uh, and compressors are used absolutely in all the industries so in any factory you would find compressed uh, air system and 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 they are big consumers of energy so the focus has to be always there uh, what is very special also about compressors because a lot of heat is uh, is created when uh, when uh, air is compressed by by a compressor uh, and i believe there is still a huge potential to all of us to to recover that heat so uh, more and more installations have uh, energy recovery systems included and uh, and we have a lot of great uh, you know reference cases but uh, just on the right side there theoretically if we would just assume that all, all the compressors which are installed uh, in the uk would be connected uh, to the energy recovery and uh, we will be re recovering the, all that heat which we otherwise release so these are just astonishing numbers you know that we can um, potentially recuperate so going into the technology so on the, on the next slide uh, basically if we, if we don't go to any more details compressor takes atmospheric air at the inlet and compresses the air uh, at the outlet so on most of industrial applications would be around uh, seven to ten bar pressure, and uh, and then uh, uh, it takes obviously electrical energy at the input, and and a lot of heat is then released during the compression uh, stage. So and that heat can be recaptured, and uh, in the form of hot water, then this energy can be recovered. And there are a lot of. Uh, points on the if we take oil free screw air compressor which typically has the two uh, compression stages and uh, oil cooler and intercoolers so uh, there are five points where energy can be the, the heat can be picked and uh, our energy recovery compressors uh, which have this uh, option included uh, provides that so uh, basically we for an oil free compressor we speak about 90 percent of the input uh, electrical energy can be recovered in a in a form of hot water and it's a high degree heat so we speak about 90 degrees celsius so then as uh, the, the best application is obviously you know the steam boilers uh, the make of water for the steam boilers uh, and often it's also uh, uh, located very close to each other so those are just you know perfect applications but uh, not only the uh, uh, oil free water cooled compressors if we go to the next one uh, yeah so that's that's how it works with the water cooled compressor which you have on the left side we have a big range of the standard energy recovery units which are actually controlled and uh, because not all the heat would be taken by the consumer. So it would be making sure that the water which returns to a compressor is always uh, controlled at the stable temperature, no matter how much heat is taken by a consumer. Uh, so we have also uh, 
those kind of uh, modular systems uh, products which are you know really plug and play and and can be integrated in in most of uh, existing installations as well but uh, but also if it's an air cooled in a smaller uh, factories you know typically it's uh, oil injected air cooled compressor which is used uh, and there obviously a lot of heat can be recovered from oil because oil is used as a lubricant and as a cooling media as well so uh, and there we can uh, connect also as you see on this picture a small uh, energy recovery modules which are heat exchangers you know oil to water and uh, and we can recover also all the heat from um, from oil and then uh, the hot water can be provided to to any applications uh, in this case as well so also i put there some example in the numbers uh, uh, you know we can uh, translate it also in the of course in the mandatory terms and it's uh, just astonishing how much energy can be uh, can be recovered and another thing we are introducing this year is also a very compact and modular screw expander. So basically, our core technology, which is a, which is a screw elements uh, for compression, we can also rotate in uh, in another direction. So and then uh, we just launched this year a number of uh, expanders, very compact units. So anywhere where, you know, pressure. Uh, incoming pressure would be higher than the outgoing for example it can work with the natural gas system if you if you get a gas on pipeline and you you need to reduce the pressure uh, for your factory so that would be a perfect application then uh, then through this expansion we can uh, obviously turn a generator and 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 generate electricity out of that so it can work with steam it can work with uh, with natural gas and uh, nitrogen so many many other examples as well thank you thank you alexander yep. um, all right we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna move forward a little bit more so do we have Bryony turner with us um hello everyone and um, thank you very much for having me here today at mx i'm going to take you for a whistle stop tour of some really exciting uh, advances um in the space world um with regard to uh, the net zero agenda and climate action as uh, Graham Peters uh, pointed out, the climate crisis needs a new industrial revolution that doesn't necessarily have to be on this planet. So let me try and convince you about that. Next slide, please. So Space for Climate um, is a group that unites UK expertise in climate satellite data. It's my job to coordinate it. We span government, industry, academia, and the third sector, and everyone in the group um, is involved somewhere along the data supply chain um, in uh, either sort of designing and devising and building uh, satellite missions capable of bringing down climate data um, or uh, processing those or analyzing those. Um, and turning them into sort of decision uh, decision support tools. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of a, a whirlwind tour of that. Um, I think it's quite important to highlight to the MX audience that um, one of the reasons that the group is, is has formed and, and is, is acting to raise the profile of um, space-enabled climate expertise and services is that there's been a huge amount of um, public investment, not just by the UK, but many other countries internationally to um, produce robust uh, climate data sets. And um, whilst they've predominantly been used uh, from science perspective for monitoring Earth and to understand how our climate's changing. They also can be used to inform climate action, which I hope I will uh, be able to convince you of. Um, uh, so we connect users, um, users to producers. So I just mentioned we go right from, uh, we've got uh, expertise in the group uh, that uh, build and design new satellite missions. I'm going to talk to you in a moment about microcarb. Um, and then I've just sort of shown uh, a few, uh, tried to make it a bit more tangible with some images, um, showing you some CO2 emissions satellite data there. Um, so the, the data is then collated. Um, there's a lot of verification and quality assurance. And then you have the kind of information translation. It's very big data. So you can see an example there from NASA of um, carbon dioxide anomaly. So what, it gives an idea of sources and sinks. Um, and then value added services, which I'll come on to an example there by the Institute for Environmental Analytics, uh, which I think you'll find uh, interesting in renewable energy. Um, so uh, there's a new mission uh, that now spot the spot the deliberate error. I, I corrected it in one place on the slide and, and didn't manage to correct it on the, the first line. Um, the microcarb mission, a very exciting mission, 
mission is going to be measuring uh, sources and sinks of carbon dioxide. I mean, it'll have a city sweep mapping mode, which is going to be really, really interesting. You can actually see the carbon flux. It's not just have a carbon emissions counting, but what's actually generating emissions and, and what is actually um, absorbing them and acting as a source, both for um, uh, anthropogenic emissions, but also the natural environment. Um, it was due to launch um, uh, in 2020, but um, uh, the satellite uh, building has been delayed by COVID. So uh, it will now be scheduled to launch in 2022. Um, so uh, next up, um, I've got an example of, I've gone, you know, sort of giving you a taster of a satellite uh, mission that's um, coming, we'll be bringing new kind of carbon dioxide data, but there's still, there still is um, existing data sets out there, um, uh, including carbon dioxide, but also other greenhouse gas emissions. So an example here from Airbus. Um, so Airbus have um, over three decades of experience in um, asset level monitoring. And um, we have in our group, the intelligence bit of Airbus that works with the climate satellite data aspect. So combine the asset level monitoring that they're very good at, um, and their, their sort of processing of big petabytes of data uh, with climate data. Um, I didn't have a carbon emissions example to give you here, but I've got the example here from Sentinel-5P where they very quickly turned around the nitrogen dioxide emissions to look at uh, the impact of the lockdown um, on the UK. So the point being with this image is to say that, yes, you can look at um, the sort of asset level monitoring, but also you can task and look at um, uh, political boundaries as well. Next slide, please. An example of where we're kind of pushing ahead with new types of analytics um, is uh, to look at um, questions we had from land managers. And um, it was really led by a, a, a peatland scientist who actually wanted to know can we not only reduce emissions from peatlands, but also help contribute to other climate uh, climate action as well? So could we reduce surface albedo, so uh, the uh, the temperature, and and help reduce heat risk uh, with uh, interventions uh, that are restoring peatlands? Um, so this requires a lot of data um, and a lot of near real time data. Um, so uh, a similar. Um, uh, Came, came forward with their data cube um, to harness the Earth observation data. And uh, if anyone is interested in this, um, we built the data cube is built by similar for the UK. So you are welcome. We, we've got the ability to um, have a number of people tested out and it could um, have other uses as well as for, for peatland monitoring. Um, so this one I thought you'd be particularly interested uh, to an MX audience and in fact uh, the IEA did come on stand for those of you who might have visited a space for climate stand at MX last year. Um, so the Institute for Environmental Analytics have developed a renewable energy space analytics tool um, and they combine ground-based observations, weather data and satellite data to help, um, help basically do um, everything as far as I could see with um, renewable energy um, scenario testing, planning. planning. Um, we heard earlier about the um, uh, sort of working out the power. I think it could be interesting with the, the battery side of things. Um, uh, look at the financial viability. The, they can run different scenarios. So one of the important things, why you need the weather data, I mean, some of you would be more expert uh, in this than, than I, um, but to understand the downtime under different scenarios, um, and particularly where you've got mixes of renewable energy. So this tool was actually developed initially to help small island developing state nations um, via UK Space Agency funding um, to meet their renewable energy targets and be more energy in, independent. And I think another thing to point out about the efficiencies uh, that can be devised with these analytics um, is also that you can uh, more accurately calculate what's your reserve fossil fuel that you need to have and potentially not need to be holding as much in storage. Um, so I just wanted to um, end, um, this is my penultimate slide actually, um, but you might have seen a, a news release about this. Uh, the UK government has um, uh, uh, launched a, um, a research project, a scoping project being led by Fraser and Nash Consultancy with Oxford Economics to explore space-based solar power systems. The advantage is in space, of course, is that the sun never sets. Um, uh, however, I wanted to pick up on what Laura Reesdale was saying earlier that, you know, data um, and particularly these kind of petabytes of, of data that are involved in the analytics I've been talking about 
um, you know, they have an energy cost too. This is something the space sector is very conscious of. Some of those platforms I, I showed you with the analytics, the whole point of them, like a data cube or a cloud platform, is that you can actually have greater efficiency of data because everyone is not downloading the data onto their own computer and then analyzing it. It's um, cloud enabled. I just wanted to end now with this, this point that um, whilst we're talking about net zero and these efforts for the zero carbon agenda, um, if you actually look at the UNFCCC race to zero, it is very specific about it being a healthy, resilient, uh, low carbon recovery. Um, and so I just wanted to, to end with saying um, that the Space for Climate Group has been working particularly with the financial services sector who will all be investing in your types of products um, to help with climate risk disclosure um, tools and services so that any 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 product that's being developed for net zero uh, needs to be able to stand the test of its its asset lifetime with the changes in climate we're already anticipating. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brian. Yeah, that's really interesting stuff. And as a space geek myself, I'm uh, I'm I'm very interested to hear more about that. If there, if if you can keep your eye on the Q and A, um, if everybody, everybody's got any questions for you, um, if you could answer those so that we can all see the answers, that would be. Um, absolutely fantastic. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna move, carry on with the same um, uh, uh, schedule and move to uh, Matthew uh, Truella, um, managing director of Kenza Contracting now, um, and then we'll come back to Lydia and Jeff um, uh, 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 shortly. Okay, over to you, Matthew. Hi there, um, it's actually David Broom. Um, I was dropped in at the last minute as Matthew's unavailable today. Um, so I've been asked to kind of step in in his uh, in his place. Um, okay. This is slightly challenging as well. Um, I've already had a call uh, this morning about this. It took me an hour and a half to properly explain what we do. Um, so to do it in five minutes is a bit of a challenge. So I'll crack straight on if we can get the, the slides up. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, I'm David Broom from Kenza Contracting. We're a national ground source heat pump contractor and our sister business, Kenza Heat Pumps, is a uh, ground source heat pump man uh, manufacturing business. Um, we've been building ground source heat pumps in the UK for 20 years. Um, have you got my slides available? There you go. Um, if we could just skip straight on to the next one. Um, so just very briefly, just to touch on ground source heat pumps and how they work. Essentially, what we do is we take a large volume of low grade heat. Um, we harness that heat and we compress it and upgrade it into useful heat for homes and businesses. And the key element of it is the closer the temperatures are between where we take the energy from and where we're putting it into, the closer those two temperatures are, the less work the compressor has to do and the more efficient uh, the system will operate. Um, and uh, heat pumps seem to be uh, yeah, coming towards the, the forefront of people's minds. We have to spend a lot less time explaining the technology now, which is great. Um, what we have is a slightly different application for the technology than your standard kind of domestic individual um, installations. Uh, so next slide, please. So what Kenza have been pioneering over the last seven or eight years um, is what's become known as kind of fifth generation district heating or ambient loop district heating. And, and the heating sector was referred to as the uh, elephant in the room earlier. So hopefully we can uh, yeah, start answering some of those questions as to how we, we uh, deliver on these challenges. So what we do is we take traditional heating and we kind of flip it on its head a little bit. Um, and we use the low temperature circuit that connects all of the heat pumps together to distribute energy around the circuit. And then we upgrade the heat to useful heat at the point of use. So typically this is within individual buildings and we've done lots of social housing retrofit, including tower blocks, where we've taken out mains gas combi boilers, replaced it with ground source heat pumps with individual units within each dwelling, providing space heating and domestic hot water, improving compliance, but also providing a solution that doesn't impact on kind of fuel poverty because we're not increasing the running cost of the residents um, compared to mains gas. The benefit of doing it that way with uh, of rather than doing a central plant is that all of the network is on the cold side rather than the hot side of the heat pump. So we design out any system distribution losses around the circuit. It also means that all of the billing is individual to each end user. So the heat pump is downstream of the end user's electric meter. So they just pay for their heat as part of their electric bill and they can do away with their gas standing charge. So that makes another, another saving. Um, and that network, as I say, operates typically anywhere from two to eight degrees, but can operate up to 20 degrees, um, connecting all of those heat pumps together if we've got some waste heat on the circuit. So the heat can be developed through um, closed loop boreholes, so drilling down to 
a uh, couple of hundred meters to take the uh, take the energy out of the ground. We can use groundwater, um, so energy available in aquifers, and we can also use surface water as well. So there's lots of residual energy available in the in the ground uh, around us. Um, but what we can also do um, is we can harness lots of forms of waste heat because we've got that circuit running at ambient temperature. It can equally be used for space cooling and process cooling as well as heating. So I was very interested to see Brian's uh, mention of kind of uh, water cooled data centers earlier. We could harness all of that energy, put that into our ambient loop network and distribute that amongst all of the heat pumps on the circuit to deliver, uh, as I say, space heating and hot water. And what that also allows us to do is have heat pumps sized and specified to each individual load at any point on the circuit. So again, if you've got more industrial uh, or commercial applications, larger and high temperature heat pumps can be used to service that. And then low temperature heat pumps uh, and heat pumps providing uh, kind of small scale heating and domestic hot water for dwellings can also be used. So the, that, that ambient loop circuit then becomes kind of a, a heating and cooling loop that can be used anywhere amongst the circuit to, um, uh, to generate heat and cooling. And as I say, process cooling can also be used. Energy from waste um, kind of connections to uh, any other form of waste heat can come in. Uh, and again, that also assists with the, with the business model in terms of reducing costs for cooling as well as heating. Um, what we can then also do uh, is optimize the operation of the heat pump um, based on the variable cost of electricity. So even without having any thermal or battery storage, we can actually use the building physics to move around how we uh, operate the heat pumps, still maintaining the performance and comfort levels that you're looking at, but avoiding the peaks um, of uh, electricity, um, therefore reducing the operating cost and also the carbon emissions. So if we go on to the next slide, please. So just by moving um, kind of four half hourly slots uh, of the heat pump operation into lower peak, uh, lower cost operating times, we can save kind of 15 to 20% of operating costs. Um, and, and all that basically means is we bring the heat pumps on slightly earlier, we heat to a slightly higher temperature and then turn them off again and let the building cool itself down when electricity becomes more expensive. Uh, and we see this as being a big part of the, the future of the rollout of, uh, uh, of of renewable heat in the UK and that's how we look to combine with other um, uh, renewable generation and electrical storage. Uh, next slide please. So just as a practical example um, we are kind of um, uh, nearing completion on the first phase of the Oxford Super Hub project, uh, which is the installation of 60 dwellings uh, retrofitted uh, into social housing properties for stonewater housing. Uh, these all feature individual heat pumps connected to a shared ground loop and all installed with smart controls that allow us to provide that level of, of, of home uh, automation and optimization, uh, reducing the running cost of the residents even further uh, by um, uh, yeah, by switching the operation of the heat pump into off-peak times. Um, and then as we kind of, that, that scheme, part of that scheme is also um, kind of large-scale um, transmission connected battery storage uh, and bringing the whole thing together to basically ensure that as, as far as possible, localised energy is used to, um, uh, yeah, provide the operation for those heat pumps. So uh, I don't know how I'm doing for time. I fairly well rattled through that and skipped on lots of detail. So if anybody um, wants to know any more, please ask the questions or get in touch um, separately. Uh, I'd be more than happy to talk through a little more length and a little more detail. But um, yeah, we're certainly confident that um, yeah, ground source heat pumps and uh, ambient uh, temperature district heating has got a big part to play in the, the decarbonisation of heat in the UK. Thank you, David. Absolutely agree with you. I think um, heat pumps are going to play a massive uh, um, part in um, uh, uh, heat decarbonisation. Um, so thank you very much for giving your pitch. Any questions for David, please pop them on the Q&A. And David, if you, if you could answer those so that we can all see. Hi, Lydia. Hello, Scott. Hi. How are oh, you? Hi. Great pleasure I'm to be well. here. Excellent. Um, over to you. You have seven minutes. Go for it. Thank you. So I would like to start my presentation to show you uh, a building that displays a 62 foot wide 15 digit electronic clock. And you can pass to the next slide, please. Yes. Um, and this clock is so important because it displays a deadline for us to take decisive actions to keep global warming under 1.5 degrees 
uh, comparing to the industrial, uh, pre-industrial levels. So this clock shows we only have seven years left to deplete the 420 gigatons of CO2 budget to burn. So no need to say how much this brings the future into focus and time really urges for us to find a realistic solution um, to, turn this, to turn this out. We in our company really believe that bio charcoal it's the solution for these problems. So, thank you. So biochar, uh, it's basically uh, charcoal, but differently from the charcoal that we are used to use in for grill purposes, which is basically um, or technically uh, uh, made from wood, this biochar is um, basically made from any type of biomass. So um, when you heat this biomass, uh, in an oxygen starvation environment, uh, you thermally decompose this biomass into three things. You have, you can uh, pass on please, uh, you have combustible gases, you have tar and oils, and you have the solid uh, compose, which we call biochar. And this process is known by pyrolysis. So when you take a look in a microscope at this compound, this compound, you can see it's full of channels uh, uh, and uh, he has a lot, a lot of open area, um, which give it, gives it um, two fundamental properties, highly porous and with a huge surface. And more, this surface area is weakly negative, which is great um, to drawing minerals into its surface. So, uh, this is the material used for centuries and millennia to amend soils. And you can pass, please. You can see how different the yield of crops can be when you really use biochar and you don't. Um, so making biochar is not, it's not a new technology. It's the most uh, old industry. Uh, art um, that we can think of and pyrolyzing uh, organic debris uh, to, to, to make um, gases is not new either. Now, um, what is new is that we can use this substance apart from soil amendment to combat climate change. And how does that happen? A little biology will explain. Next slide, please. So plants um, pull out what is arguably life's most impressive magic trick from plain daylight um, and uh, a bit of uh, water and minerals from the soil, they transformed carbon dioxide into pure oxygen to build their mass. So when we use this mass and you pyrolyze it, we are trapping the carbon of this constitution, <laughs> trapping it in a very, very stable structure that lasts, that takes thousands of years to decay and contains around 70% of carbon in it. So apart from having great benefits to the soil, we can trap so we carbon our own dioxide from the atmosphere. <laughs> and producing biochar massively in a large scale, we are able to offset 12% of human uh, greenhouse gas production. Next slide, please. This chart represents the total <laughs> CO2 emissions, um, and it shows that uh, uh, we are far from still slow down our carbon emissions. So curtailing GHG emissions alone will not be enough to decarbonization. And his, he, here is where biochar is different. Because in addition to avoiding emissions, biochar sequesters carbon in the soil, removing it from the atmosphere and working as a long lasting and stable sink. So you can pass the next slide, please. We call this carbon negative and being carbon negative is planet positive. This technology positively impacts 11 out of 17 sustainable development goals uh, set up by uh, United Nations, um, revealing that biochar is a really, really powerful tool for a variety of environmental challenges that we face today. We all know that our economy is totally dependent on petrochemics, and we are all paying the price with eroded soils, polluted waterways, oceanic uh, dead zones, and other externalities that pile onto the global threat of sustainable development goals. But soil holds the key. Next, please. Uh, 
Earth soils contains more carbon than the atmosphere and the terrestrial ecosystems combined. And yet we are losing them at a rate approaching 100 tons uh, a year. One, one inch of soil takes 100 of years to, to be built, but biochar can jumpstart soil formation. So in conclusion, by globally adopting these solid building strategies, along with technologies to win us off fossil uh, fuels, uh, it is our belief that we can not only delay our climate clock, but also put carbon back where it belongs in the soil. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's Thank very, you. very great. Thank you. Um, okay, so we don't have any uh, time for any questions for Lydia. So um, where are we moving now? Jeff um, uh, Edwards uh, from Axair Fans Limited. Jeff, over to you. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Good. Sorry about that. Okay. Good morning, Scott. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Edwards. I work for Axair Fans as the uh, Business Development Director. I'm going to talk to you today about the AHU refurbishment, uh, specifically using uh, EC fan grids. Uh, first slide, please. Thank you. Um, the core of the EC fan grid is the EC motor. The EC motor is a combination of uh, a DC motor uh, and, an, and, and an AC motor. Uh, and what you get with that is the energy efficiency and controllability of the DC motor uh, with the relative ease and, and flexibility of uh, the relative, readily available um, and well distributed AC uh, power. Um, the primary two advantages of the EC motor are the uh, energy efficiencies you get and the controllability you can have over the motor. Um, and uh, that provides uh, really meaningful uh, running cost reductions, both from an energy consumption point of view and a maintenance point of view. Uh, and with the onboard uh, connectivity, uh, the uh, interrogation of the motor to give you greater insights into the performance of your uh, HVAC capital equipment is, is quite useful as well. So the the, um, the EC fan grid itself um, is a is the uh, addition of the EC motor to an impeller that will move the air and then using multiples of these. So it is in fact a, a fan grid, a, a fan array. There are uh, lots of uh, good key benefits to that, but but for the sake of um, of being uh, quick, uh, that I've, I've listed just the top three really now the flexibility of the solution is is really one of the uh, nice things about it you can have uh, almost any combination of inter internal configuration of an ahu uh, combined with um uh, really uh, any any size of um performance so uh, airflow and and pressure loss systems because of the array or <clears throat> modular nature of the fan grid, they, uh, there is an inherent inbuilt redundancy, uh, which allows for single or even multiple fan failures, uh, but the solution as a whole is still providing um, a, a minimum airflow, or at least, or even 100% uh, of the requirement at, at, uh, at the initial design stage. Um, the efficiency um, with the enhanced control, with using EC motors, uh, the system can save up to uh, 30%. Occasionally, it can be more, um, and that is very meaningful. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. At 30% savings, you can comfortably get um, uh, ROIs of down to about one and a half years two years, three years is typical. Uh, here we have a small um, uh, application case study. This was actually in Germany at a bank note printing site. Uh, in the uh, image on the left is the original fan that was, that was installed and uh, it was replaced with the fan grid that you can see on the right. The original uh, two fans were consuming over 67 uh, kilowatts uh, per hour. 
and the replacement fan grids uh, reduce that consumption down to 46 kilowatt hours. You can see there that the, um, the CO2 reductions uh, were dropped by 100 tonnes a year uh, and the payback period was, was only 18 months. Uh, if I could have the last slide, please. Okay, um, so what does a, a, a project delivery look like for, from AXA? There would be an initial site assessment. Um, probably that would be um, a desktop study by myself from, from my from my office uh, in conjunction with, with a customer side, um, trying to understand uh, what they want to achieve from their project um, and their, their performance parameters. That would likely lead to uh, um, an on-site survey. Uh, and that can be, uh, depending on, again, what's wanted, what is wanted to be achieved, uh, that could just be uh, simply uh, assessing the site, um, the premise itself, the internal measurements of the AHU, site access, so on and so forth. Um, if a more in-depth uh, understanding of the savings, uh, carbon emission reductions, um, uh, electrical consumption savings, is wanted, then um, we can do a full validation survey. So the whole parameter of the AHU are defined. Following those site surveys, a quote is provided. Um, and that's, there's a back and forth about the different, uh, different options. There are almost always uh, two or three different ways of, of going about delivering the project. Um, if the project was to go ahead, any, any site surveys that have been charged are uh, uh, deducted from the value of the quote um, and then and then we go forward into delivering the project so thank you very much everybody that's that's me that's that's me done just about under time thanks jeff very much appreciated um okay so now we're gonna um move to andy bray um head of sales at iem uh, to talk about predictive maintenance in renewable energy assets hi scott good morning hopefully you can all hear me Yes, and see you. Excellent stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I think my talk, interestingly, having learned, listened to a number of the others, will work across one or two of the others. I think there's some link with Brian's, Ian's, and Brian's. So very briefly on who we are, I work for IM. Uh, we've been going for around 15 years. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, we provide software for uh, renewable services and re renewable products on a worldwide basis. Uh, the you know we get data from interestingly listening to Bryony e from satellites from drones from um, data loggers from technical specs and one of the key skills is blending all the data in so we provide um, services across the world um, in the places you can see and we provide it in PV wind storage microgrids and you know and starting to look into e-mobility so the talk today will be around um, predictive maintenance. So on a recent webinar I attended, um, somebody mentioned a figure of about $500 billion will be needed just for some major countries, just for the investment in wind and PV to hit the world targets. I think if you add in the figures for battery storage, EV and all the other um, investments into renewable, that figure will be undoubtedly be higher than that. So what are people going to need to want to do with their assets? Undoubtedly, the investment in all these assets will need to be optimised. So where does predictive maintenance fit into that? Um, some maintenance schedules can sit at this end, which is reactive. It's great, you know, if something goes wrong, you go and fix it. But as a basic practicality, the more advanced uh, your intelligence, the more advanced the data, the better you, you actually start to use um, that data, then you know, it really does drive some greater value. This is a, um, an excellent report from Deloitte. I think I've referenced it on the next slide as to where then the value you can get by using predictive maintenance. Sorry, if you could just pop back to the next slide. Um, and yeah, so, so predictive maintenance comes from a number of sources. It comes from technical specs. It comes from previous uh, performance. It comes from you know, analysis of how the, the plant and the equipment is actually using. And as people, both end users as organizations are looking to really use uh, and invest more into renewable energy, we believe that predictive maintenance really has to be part of your um, program going forward. Next slide, please. 
So the Deloitte paper, um, again, I won't read all of those ones out, but you, know, you can see the values that predictive maintenance can really drive the improvements in uptime and you know, the improvements in performance and output. And we did a recent webinar um, where you know, from talking to our customers by adding in predictive maintenance, it, re it increases uh, the return on investment on their PV plants by a minimum of 5%. So if you're investing in PV, if you're looking at other areas, then that really just shows the value that predictive maintenance can bring. So if you go to the next slide, please. So what's our experience in predictive maintenance? We work around PVs, I've mentioned. We do predictive maintenance for hydro. We do predictive maintenance. I'll put my false teeth in for wind turbines. And again, by combining and blending a number of datas for PV, it could be identifying hotspots, inverter issues, et cetera. Um, you know, we provide a web-based platform for our customers to really have high quality, intelligent data. And we've done a lot of work on the predictive side, and we found that over 90% of our estimates where there's going to be an issue from predictive maintenance proved to be accurate, um, which I think if you're providing any for type of forecast, that's you know, very, very impressive numbers. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we would like to do, um, and this is uh, to, to everybody, and initially that I think the conversations from Brian uh, and Ian um, around the whole battery space. We're looking to now add predictive maintenance for battery storage. Battery storage will be huge uh, for microgrids, smart grids. I think the battery EV combination will undoubtedly be growing hugely over the next few period, EV charging plants, etc. So we're looking to try and see, can we add predictive maintenance using our skills and expertise um, and to develop that as a service, as an offering. Next slide, please. So how might this look like? Um, this is a very sort of simple concept. So you have the battery storage maintenance here by adding in a number of uh, sources of data. So it could be sort of the technical specs, wind forecast, um, and a number of other areas using the machine models and using the artificial intelligence tools that we have to again, to try and provide a simple output uh, for organizations to identify where there are going to be issues with predictive maintenance. Next slide, please. So again, this is a bit more detail to try and identify, to look at some issues for, for customers in terms of monitoring, technical support, and then to help people with power management, black star mode and peak load, peak load shaving. So this is uh, an idea we'd be very keen to talk to people about. And I think that's uh, very quick. I've rushed through mine, so I'm probably slightly ahead of time. Scott, you'll be pleased. Well done. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's great to hear somebody else talking about the importance of maintenance and how maintenance impacts on um, uh, performance. Um, absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank okay, you. so we're now going to move to Chris Davis, who's UK sales manager of Hisopt. Did I get that right? Um, talking about digitizing um, HVAC design for low carbon performance. Over to you, Chris. Thank, thank you, Scott, for that. Um, I'm Chris Davis. I'm the UK manager for a company called Hisopt. Uh, we produce design and simulation software for optimizing commercial scale heating and cooling systems. Um, and what I'm going to talk to, to you about today is how digitization and digital twin technology can be used to help both building owners uh, and engineering companies to optimize and improve uh, HVAC performance uh, to both lower carbon emissions as we head towards a low uh, net zero carbon future and also to tackle energy cost reduction. Um, so, um, oops, I need to move my notes on here. Um, so yeah, in the interest of time, I think everyone understands what the issue is in terms of decarbonization and the role of heat and cooling in buildings within that. So I won't dwell on that for too much. Um, but also, as we drive towards an economic recovery, the energy cost savings from optimizing heating and cooling are also uh, significant and important as well. So all this might mean, you know, a number of things, you know, certainly moving away from fossil fuels for, 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 for heating uh, and introducing, you know, technologies uh, such as heat pumps, uh, connecting more buildings to heat networks, making more use of waste heat, for example, uh, or indeed just optimizing existing installations because there's so much inefficiency in actually most, most heating and cooling installations. Uh, and of course, the really big challenge is how to do this in both existing buildings and, as well as new ones. Um, and one of the major challenges here is around the way in 
the traditional approach to the way heating and cooling systems are designed, which typically it ends up in efficiency on paper and in theory, but rarely actually in practice. And the major reason for this is a lack of transparency. So, you know, so for example, you know, most systems, whether they be heating systems or cooling systems, they're designed for a single peak load condition, um, but without any knowledge of how that system is really going to behave under, under part load conditions where they spend 99% of the year actually operating. Um, we're also seeing designs now for, for low energy, low carbon systems becoming much more complex. Um, we've, we're seeing you know, lots of high cost green technologies being introduced, heat pumps and CHPs, uh, you know, uh, thermal storage, heat recovery systems. But there's not enough knowledge and thought given to how the whole system will integrate together and perform in actual use. So the performance of this these, these technologies are not transparent to anybody at the design stage. No one's taking that holistic approach. And then we also have a, an issue where we start to see um, uh, this performance gap between uh, design intent uh, and how systems actually perform in, in real life as well. So all of this means we kind of need this, uh, this kind of yeah, this, this system based approach. So my slide here was supposed to build up. It was supposed to be a, a cool little video, but never mind. I'll, I'll, just, talk, I'll, just, I'll just talk through it. Um, um, so this is where digitization technologies really start to help, actually. Firstly, by introducing uh, measurable performance at the design stage. And then secondly, by ensuring that the integrity of the of, of an optimized design is translated into the as-built installation. And this is done in two ways. So firstly, um, as a design and a simulation tool, a digital twin or digital model of the installation can simulate and predict how it will perform under both full and part low conditions uh, in real life. So the design can be optimized uh, to remove any hydraulic inefficiencies uh, and make sure everything is calculated properly. And what this allows is then multiple iterations of, uh, of, of a system design to be compared side by side and compared objectively in terms of energy use, energy costs, carbon emissions, comfort, and so on. So the right commercial and engineering choices are made at the, at, at the early stages. Secondly, then, it's about um, securing the integrity of the design into the, into the installation and commissioning phases. And the whole idea, then, is that the, is that the digital model is transferable at every stage of the, of, of the process, from design all the way through to installation, commissioning, and handover. So you have the seamless knowledge of how that installation is supposed to perform, uh, and it, even to, down to the point of how it should be commissioned correctly uh, at, at, at that point of a project. And what I was going to show you here, the, the kind of video is not working, but essentially what, what a digital twin looks like is a, is, is a two-dimensional CAD drawing that sat behind it is a mathematical model that understands exactly how uh, all of that system operates and, and kind of works, works together. And maybe you'll see a still of that in just a second. And then finally, the digital model that's created becomes an asset for the operator. So uh, when the system's handed over, they not only know what that system is, but also how it's supposed to perform. If you can flick on to the next slide, please. So here's an example of this. You can see on the right-hand side there, that's a little digital twin I was talking about. It's that, it's that mathematical model that understands how it all works. This, this example actually is from a recent renovation project we've just completed with a large uh, private sector company. They were looking to um, replace some existing uh, gas boilers with uh, add some, some air source heat pumps into that installation as well to, uh, to provide part of the heating. Now, what you can see here in the in the in the brown boxes there is what you get from the design from, from the engineering sector today. This is a typical M and E design. Everything's based on, on on a peak load condition. When we digitize that design to, to actually check it, what we can what we can show straight away. We showed this to the client is that actually the contribution from the heat pumps they were going to have was, was actually only about ten percent of the annual energy uh, uh, contribution. Cost savings will be between about 14% of the, of the energy cost per year and maybe around 17% carbon savings over their older existing gas boiler system. By going through um, a, a and it, was, it was obvious right away that the, the design choices that were being made there would limit the optimal performance of the, of the, of the new boilers and the, and the heat pumps. Now, going through the, an optimization exercise using digital tools to simulate different improvement options, you can see the impact. So with the same equipment, the, the design was just changed hydraulically, 
uh, and you can see we've more than, more than doubled the, uh, the annual energy cost saving and almost tripled the carbon saving. Same building, same equipment, just integrated hydraulically differently. This is what we mean by bringing transparency into the design stage. Last slide, please, if you can, Chris. There we go. So, so yeah, in conclusion, the digitization of HVAC systems brings transparency of how systems will perform at the design stage and helps to ensure that design intent is translated into the actual installation to maximize energy cost savings and carbon savings as we look to move towards non-traditional technologies. So thanks for listening. Uh, my contact details are on the screen. If you're a building owner and looking at decarbonizing heat or cooling in any of your buildings, please feel free to get in touch if you'd like to know more. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Chris. That was um, that was a great way to uh, uh, finish them all up. Um, and thank you to all of our um, speakers today. Uh, uh, we're glad you had the opportunity to to uh, present uh, your technologies um, uh, without um, uh, being able to see people in person at MX. Uh, I'm now going to pass across to Jason to uh, just do a few um, closing words. Um, uh, 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 before we uh, close the session. Thank you, Scott, and thank you for managing that session. It's um, th This is so far from ideal. We, we've spent um, seven years building, um, building MX and the community, and um, it, it works so much better when everyone is together. It works so much better when you can bump into people that maybe you haven't seen in a long time or not met before at all, but can share a conversation that triggers something. Um, Zoom's been terrific this year for sharing messages that are planned, but it doesn't let the magic happen. It doesn't let the impromptu conversations. So um, we hope you'll all join us next year. Um, we're very excited to... Um, to build up to a real celebration of um, life, hopefully getting back to a new sort of normality. Um, but it's also great to have the opportunity over the last week or so to, to, to work with so many um, people that have been involved with the EMA and um, MX over the years and put together a great program. So um, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Rupert, I think, who's run off to, um, to vote in Parliament and, um, and everyone else who's given their time. Um, also very pleased that we had um, so, some technology people able to give a presentation. We're gonna share lots of information post event, um, including a, a cool link to a 3D walk around of last year's show so we can get you in the mood for time, better times to come. Um, but thank you, that's it, we'll call it a wrap. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye.